Um, if I can thank very much, we've got James Molino, Richard Wynn and Jenny McCarkos with us today. We're really focusing on what the, the issues are, in particular for the community sector. So I'd like to thank you all for coming in on what I know is a particularly uh, busy time in the very last week of the election campaign. Uh, and it's great to have the opportunity to ask you some of the key questions that our members are really interested in today. So in terms of uh, starting, I'll leave this to, to any of you to answer. Quick question, what are, the, what are the policies or what are the key things that make uh, the ALP different to the other parties who are contesting this election? Well, I guess from, from my perspective, um, education and health, you know, you think about what, what's a state government there for? It's there to provide services, you know, an ambulance that arrives on time when you call it, um, that your local school is a good school and delivers for your children. You know, the basic services, that's what a state government's about. And my, my view is that uh, we've got a current government that, that hasn't focused on what are the basic needs for Victorian families, and that's what we'll be providing. Thank you. Uh, any other comments before moving on? Uh, in terms of relationships with the federal government, we've seen a significant raft of reviews, structural reforms at a federal level, and they're going to have a significant impact really for all Victorians. What will a future Labor government do to make sure that, keeping that in mind, to get the very best outcomes for, for all Victorians and particularly for vulnerable Victorians? Well, in my area, um, it's hard to see that the federal government have got any interest uh, or indeed any policy positions around housing and cities and how they and how they operate mm. and I think that's quite very troubling um, so we would not have any confidence nor I think can the community sector have any confidence at least at this stage uh, that the federal government will have any commitment to a joint Commonwealth state arrangement around housing uh, and I think that's quite fundamental and certainly if we do get the honour of being elected, uh, we'll, uh, I'll be on my bike to uh, go and see Minister Andrews to say, well, you know, what is your position uh, and what do you intend to do in terms of so many of these Commonwealth state agreements that, that uh, directly impact on Jenny's area and my area in particular, uh, which are crucial to the long-term sustainability of so many of these key service areas, and I'm sure you'd agree, Jenny. Yes, if I could just add, uh, mm. also in, in the early childhood area, mm. uh, the very concerning fact that it now looks like the Abbott government wants to actually get out of uh, providing any contribution to early childhood funding. So um, the national partnership agreements come to an end. They've only provided very short-term ongoing funding for 15 hours of kindergarten. And I will be very outspoken and will be very strident in our criticism uh, of that short-term funding and, mm. uh, and saying to the federal government, that they must continue to be a direct funding provider of 15 hours uh, for kindergarten in, in our state and around the country. If I, if I could add to yeah. Emma, the point is we will work with the Abbott government but we yeah. won't work for them. But I think all, all of us have got a fear and I think in the broader community as well. You've seen uh, the first Abbott budget uh, talking about billions of dollars cut out of health, out of education, out of support for at-risk young people, um, they're cutting youth connections. The fear is that they're deliberately making all these cuts, putting the pressure on the states and territories to pick up yes. on those areas that they're withdrawing from, mm. um, and then coming cap in hand back to the federal government and say, please, can you increase the GST? So we're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. um, we've ruled that out. Yep. Uh, but it's going to be quite a quite a, a difficult period in the in the years ahead but one you know we're we're not going to um, to sit back and not not have that fight not have that argument in my area um, around the Gonski funding yes. you know the mm -hmm. link between educational outcomes and disadvantage yes. the fact that uh, the Abbott government are walking away from years five and six of the Gonski yes. agreement uh, that will be a significant issue over the over the over the next mm. few years yeah, absolutely thank you uh, in terms of building on some of those points, maybe going from the federal government but looking at the significant increase in the cost of living for Victorians as well. So we've seen bills uh, skyrocketing for ordinary Victorians around utilities, uh, uh, food, etc. And we've seen an increase in the number of um, Victorians who are really struggling to meet their cost of living. What will a future Labor government do to turn that around and to really um, help those families who are facing disadvantage, struggling to afford food, struggling to pay their bills? Mm. Well, one of the classics is, is of course, um, 
uh, I think, a fantastic policy uh, which James has put forward, which goes to the very heart of, of um, providing support to the most vulnerable people in our community, and that's in effect uh, the support, uh, what, what we would have called in the past education maintenance allowance. Um, this is fundamental. It's, it's about uh, kids who, who have not necessarily uh, had the, and their families, who have not had the capacity uh, to, to get the most basic things for their schooling, things like uh, uniforms, uh, things like books, uh, excursions, uh, things like that, I, I think really go to the heart of what a Labor government's about. I mean, we are about fairness and we're, you know, the concept of social justice is lost in the vocabulary of a Liberal government. They never speak those words, uh, but these are words that are, are fundamental to us as a, uh, as a Labor Party, that uh, these kids have to be given that opportunity. And all, and all the research speaks to that question, that if you provide, the, if you provide this um, basic level of support to these kids, you provide quality education, they can thrive and they do, and they do. There's no question about that. Absolutely. And also in terms of um, cost of living, you've got to be careful about what, what you can do that will make a difference mm -hmm. and, and then what's just talk. Yep. Um, and, and one of the things we, we know can make a difference is the capping of council rates. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's our policy. You look to, um, Dick would know this more than, more than sure. me, but you look to New South Wales mm -hmm. and they've had the policy of capping council rates for a mm -hmm. significant period of time. Um, and that does make a difference. So that's a concrete, yep. concrete initiative that will lower the cost of living for Victorian families. Mm. Thank you. Thanks for that. In terms of looking at jobs, we've seen significant, um, uh, in terms of the lead up to the election campaign, we've seen each party put out uh, jobs policies and there's been a significant amount of publicity, I guess, in terms of looking at the growing unemployment in Victoria overall, and particularly uh, the growing unemployment within specific segments of our community. So, for example, looking at youth unemployment that's up around 20% in mm. some areas, looking at the number of Aboriginal Victorians who are unemployed that's around 20% as well, mm. those who uh, have disabilities, again, really disproportionately um, <coughs> out of work in comparison to others. What will a future Labor government do to really looking at putting jobs on the agenda and breaking the cycle for disadvantaged Victorians so that all Victorians who are able to are able to access um, a job? Well, there's a, there's a few things in that space, and, and you're right, you know, the unemployment rate's at its worst for 13 years. Mm. Um, in my own community in the Outer East, there are 10,000 more young people unemployed today than in December 2010. Mm. Um, so it's, it's madness in that, in that um, economic situation to take the knife to our TAFE system. You know, we've got to have a, a robust, sustainable TAFE system delivering the skills for people who are either needing reskilling as they transition to another industry, another job, um, or for young people. Um, so, you know, so education's a key part of that. Uh, $320 million rescue package for TAFE mm -hmm. in our first year. And then even more importantly, Bruce McKenzie, the um, mm -hmm. former CEO of Homes Glen TAFE, will be conducting a review of the funding of our TAFE system. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna get TAFE off its knees mm -hmm. um, and delivering the skills uh, for, for our community. And you know, this, this line coming from the government that these were you know, Mickey Mouse courses and Mickey Mouse campus as well. Uh, Swinburne Lilydale, Greensboro TAFE, you know, they've been, they've, been forced to lock their doors um, and a generation of young people are missing out. So that's in the inner skill space. Yep. Um, plus we're going to be implementing um, 10 new tech schools mm. right across the state. Happy to talk mm. about that later. In the direct employment space, um, there are some, some things you can do to provide support for uh, companies. So there'll be payroll mm -hmm. tax relief uh, for companies that take on board a young person, a recently retrenched uh, person. Um, or someone who's been unemployed for a significant mm -hmm. period of time. So there'll be immediate payroll tax relief mm -hmm. um, uh, to support those companies who, um, who, who take on a, a, mm -hmm. a, a young person. Um, and secondly, there's a lot of talk about you know, our, our economy's in transition. And, you know, we've, mm -hmm. we've seen Holden and mm -hmm. Ford and Qantas and Alcoa, but what are we transitioning to? We released um, our uh, jobs package that actually targets the areas where we are strong. We've got competitive advantages, comparative advantages in certain industries, 
and we need to we need to support the growth in those industries, whether it's pharmaceuticals or mm -hmm. international education, freight and logistics, construction technology. There are things we do well, and we need to invest in those industries. Uh, in terms of looking at training, you mentioned the vocational education and training sector. So Victoria's really undergone two quite significant changes, firstly under the previous Labor government, and then we've seen a significant shift over the, um, the current coalition government as well. How will you make sure that vulnerable people are supported to enter into courses, I guess, that are relevant to the picking up jobs at the end? So not just entering into courses, but also looking at the completion of those courses so that they genuinely lead to strong mm. job opportunities. Mm. Um, one of the areas I think, or one of the next big areas of reform, um, I think one's early childhood, which is Jenny's area. The other is that the connection between senior secondary, industry, and TAFE and tertiary providers. Looking at what are the, what are the economic strengths in a region and delivering those pathways for those young people in, in that particular area. So that's, that's what the tech schools are all about. Mm -hmm. You know, and it'll be different. Each one will be different. Looking at what are the uh, what are the industry strengths in that particular region, and providing those pathways, broadening the opportunities for for young people to get those skills in those industries, so they can get a job where they live. Thank you. Mm. Any other comments in terms of uh, vocational education, and in terms of moving on to education, which is obviously specifically your area, James? Yeah. Looking at um, so the Labor Party's made a number of announcements around education, uh, particularly looking at helping the, the children of vulnerable families or those who are on healthcare cards yep. you know, genuinely participate in education. So looking, as you mentioned earlier, looking at you know, the investment that would take place for um, you know, helping kids go to camps, excursions, yep. mm. sports, towards school uniforms, <clears throat> etc. In terms of looking at um, the promises that you've made in that area, is that going to address, will that fully address the gap that's been left by the education maintenance allowance? Um, look, it, it will, but there's more we need to do and I'll talk. Yep. In terms of, in terms of what this government's cut, there was the uh, the education maintenance allowance that was in two part. There was a, a school component and, and a payment to the parents. Uh, they cut the school payment mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. This is the last year of the parents' comp component. So if if uh, Dennis Napthine is re-elected, there will be no EMA. Mm -hmm. um, they've they've talked about providing some equity funding for some schools, but I can tell you there are hundreds and hundreds of schools that will get nothing. Mm -hmm. So I've been, uh, secondary schools have got in touch with me, uh, their current EMA, this is the payment to the parents, mm -hmm. is in the order of fifty or $60,000. And as Richard said, mm -hmm. this is for the very basics. Yes. Books, excursions, uniforms, for the very basics. Um, so we've, we didn't want to go to the election just talking about replacing what they're what they've cut, mm -hmm. we wanted to be innovative about it. Yep. So it's in a it's in a variety of ways, and it's it's a, a full replacement for EMA, but we've got to do mm -hmm. more. So there's the 150 million dollar camps and excursions fund. Mm -hmm. Now this is a direct payment to the school yes. for the child. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're going to every school is accountable to deliver uh, the camps, excursions, and sports trips fund for for that child. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, um, a significant um, increase in funding for state schools relief. This is for uniforms, books, stationery, software. Mm. Um, we're going to significantly expand breakfast clubs. So mm. we'll expand it to 500 schools. We're talking about 25,000 kids. Mm -hmm. We'll have something in their stomach before they start the day. Um, glasses at school, mm. again, a partnership with state yes. schools relief. So there's all those, um, there's that package of support for vulnerable families in the order of it. 220,000 children. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but the big step, the next big step, mm. is the Gonski funding. Mm -hmm. Now, the Gonski funding has been, has, has gone missing. So we've made it quite clear if we're elected uh, at the end of this week, uh, we'll have a forensic examination in terms of the Gonski National Agreement. Where, what, what was agreed? Yes. How much has been provided to mm. Victoria? And where has that money gone? Because it hasn't gone to our, um, our state schools or our uh, non-government schools. Mm -hmm. Schools have not seen any of the Gonski funding. And that's, that is a once in a lifetime opportunity to improve um, support for uh, students from a disadvantaged background, mm -hmm. whether it's socioeconomic or indigeneity or rurality um, or disability, mm -hmm. significant extra funding support for those kids. Um, this government hasn't passed that money on. Okay. Thank you. 
thank you for clarifying. Further in regard to uh, that area as well, looking at, I guess, youth um, disengagement from school, yep. we know that there's about 10,000 people, children who are of school age, but who are not engaged in, in education at the moment. And at the same time, we know that the Youth Connections Program that you mentioned earlier, which is a federally funded program, yep. it's ending. And the Youth Connections Program has been incredibly successful in linking young people back up to education uh, and to work. And we, we interviewed a young man um, on the 7.30 report on Friday night who yes. talked about how the, the Youth Connections program, it turned his life around. So for him, he, he pulled out of school really in year seven. So he, he disengaged very early. And for him, the Youth Connections program was something that's given him promise. He's now at TAFE, he's doing panel beating and carpentry. He's been clean of ice for eight months. Yep. It's a real success story. So we're really interested in what will the ALP do to help those kids who are disengaged get back into education and will you be able to fill the gap in terms of what's been left um, from Youth Connections? And Jenny might want to add, but this is, mm. this is, one, of the, this is one of the tragedies of the Abbott budget mm. and one of the challenges for any state or territory government yes. because they are vacating the field. For the first time in decades, there's no um, direct youth program coming out of the federal government. Mm. And, and state, state governments, uh, you know, if we have the honour of um, governing this state uh, come Saturday, um, the challenge for us will be how much can we pick up mm. that Tony Abbott has cut? Mm. And, and it's a finite, it's finite. Mm. Yeah, I agree with you, it's a, it's a terrific program, um, but it's, it's a question of what is, what is a state's capacity to pick up everything that Tony Abbott is cutting? Mm -hmm. And these are difficult questions. So, sorry, Jenny. I'm, I'm just going to say, and in addition to Tony Abbott's cuts, we've also had the current state governments cut a whole lot of youth programs themselves. Um, they've cut um, programs for youth mentoring. Uh, and we've made some announcements about youth mentoring in the last few days. Yep. They've cut youth employment programs. Um, apart from the, t the cuts to TAFE and education, which directly impact on young people. So and we're about supporting young people, providing them opportunities in life. Um, seeing them in a positive light rather than in a negative way that, the, that we're concerned that government seeks to portray young people. And uh, you know, if you're serious about tackling um, issues around employment, youth unemployment, then you need to provide a whole range of supports around them. And, and so I think our plan around focusing on education and TAFE in particular uh, and mentoring and those kinds of supports is, is the way to give those young people opportunities. Um, Richard, if I can direct the next question to which is in regard to housing, which mm. I know is something that's been um, dear to your heart for a very long time. Indeed. Uh, so we're continuing in Victoria, we're continuing to see a rising number of people that are homeless, and yes. we're also continuing to see an increasing number of people who are experiencing significant rental stress. Yes. Uh, we haven't heard much from the LP or for, in terms of that portfolio, and I don't know whether when you're announcing your actual policies when you'll be in a position to say more, yes. but what are you able to tell us today in terms of, I guess, the ALP's housing policy <coughs> overall mm. and, and what the ALP is planning to do to really uh, making sure that every Victorian has a secure and affordable home? Sure. It, the conversation starts obviously with the Commonwealth, as we talked mm. about earlier. So where you have a framework that is so uncertain, it's a bit difficult uh, for uh, state governments to really position themselves when you don't have uh, any clarity around a Commonwealth state partnership arrangement. Mm -hmm. So the, the best example of that is the homelessness uh, partnership, which you know very well, uh, is one that the, the Commonwealth Government have indicated uh, will run out on in June 30 yes. of next year. Mm -hmm. We don't know whether that program will continue. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it is, uh, there is a state commitment to it, as you know, through the forward estimates for the four years, mm -hmm. and that's a good thing. And obviously, we would absolutely honour that uh, but you have, to, you have to get that framework right first. Secondly is uh, we have made some announcements already and one of them sort of slipped a little bit under the radar and that's uh, uh, inclusionary zoning. Now, VCOS and many, many uh, activists have called for inclusionary zoning to, to be part of our uh, broader policy mix and we announced that. So what we have said is that where, we, uh, where there is state government land uh, that is suitable for development, mm -hmm. uh, we would uh, look towards, on a side-by-side -side basis, uh, look towards uh, uh, inclusionary zoning being uh, mandated yes. uh, in those developments. Uh, somewhere between 10 and 15% mm -hmm. uh, needs to be for uh, affordable housing more generally, 
uh, and some of that housing will no doubt uh, be managed by our social housing providers. And that's terrific, and I'm sure they'll be um, delighted with that. We've also indicated uh, that we will have, particularly in, the, uh, in Aboriginal housing, that we will have a progressive transfer of stock which is currently uh, leased on long-term lease to Aboriginal Housing Victoria to uh, allow them to, uh, over the next uh, four years, if we have that opportunity, to build their asset base. And that's crucial for organisations that they actually own the stock, so then they can, they can borrow off the back of that and build more stock as well. Um, and, we'll all, and we've also indicated that we will look on a case-by-case -case basis with, uh, with our social housing providers to look at the whole question of stock transfer. So the, the, you know, the government, this government comes out and says, well, we're going to transfer 12,000 units to the social housing sector. Well, what are they? Where are they? What liability attends to those units? Uh, so it's easy to uh, glibly make these sorts of statements. But more, uh, we think that it is important uh, that uh, you do this in a systematic way and you do it in a partnership way with the social housing providers. Uh, and obviously I've been involved in quite detailed conversations with them about how that might look going forward. On the capital side, uh, it, it is quite challenging because we actually don't know what we're going to inherit. Um, but what we do know uh, is that this will be the first time uh, in certainly my, my history in housing, which goes back, as you, as you know, for quite a long way, um, that a government will finish its term with less public housing than when it started. So I've got a job to do if I get that opportunity uh, to actually pause and try and assess where, wh how we take this forward. So in effect, I, will, I would start about two and a half thousand units behind before we even get going. So it's a big, it's a big challenge, but it's one that uh, I'm certainly up for. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Jenny, in terms of child protection, um, interested in your thoughts on, on two, there's sort of two parts to my question, I guess. One is looking at, uh, in the child protection space, looking at how what initiatives um, you would put in place to really look at uh, helping for, the, for children to avoid going into care, I guess, in the first mm. instance. Uh, and then secondly, for those children who unfortunately do need to go into residential care, foster care, kinship care, etc., what measures you put in place to make sure that those children are safe and to enable them to lead you know, happy and, and healthy lives? Sure. Well, similar to Richard, there are enormous challenges in the child protection system that's facing enormous strain at the moment. We're seeing about um, an increase in demand of about 14, 15% a year. Uh, and so we need to look at the drivers behind that. And family violence is a very uh, key issue. There's a very strong correlation, a strong connection between family violence and child protection. In fact, uh, it, the evidence is it's about two thirds of child protection mm. cases have family violence uh, involved uh, as a factor. In fact, some people have put to me that it's much, much higher, mm. much, much higher. Mm. So we are going to look at the drivers. We're going to look at uh, uh, the focus on those drivers, family violence being one, and, and uh, we'll talk about that, mm. I'm sure, um, at, at some length uh, today. But um, family violence, um, drugs, drugs and alcohol, the ice epidemic in particular, mental health, all of these issues are issues that are playing a, a big uh, factor in driving the increasing demand. So we've got to focus on early intervention programs, providing additional support to vulnerable and at-risk families, uh, trying to keep people out of the child protection system if we can. That's got to be the starting point. Uh, but there are, there are issues in terms of uh, once they come into the system and the types of supports that, that people receive uh, in the system as well. So uh, one thing that I've expressed concern about is, um, is recently the government changed the legislation, the child protection legislation, to actually reduce the oversight role that the Children's Court plays. Mm. Now that's sort of at the end of the process uh, in, in some mm. respects, but uh, the Children's Court um, can effectively uh, order the department, um, make sure that the department's provided the necessary supports to vulnerable families. Um, and the way the government's changed the legislation has actually watered down the court's ability to do that. So we've said that we will reinstate the powers of the Children's Court to actually oversight the department to make sure that if people now have a, 
um, uh, these uh, this new uh, requirements that the clock is ticking in terms of permanent care orders mm -hmm. under the government's new legislation that the department is required to provide the necessary mm -hmm. supports whether that's drug and alcohol counselling or other kinds of supports to, to both parents and to children uh, before uh, or orders can be made uh, and we think that's going to be the very mm -hmm. important check and balance on the system. Uh, but, but there are other issues of course in terms of uh, at home care of course yes. Uh, I'll just touch upon those. Um, you know, I've expressed a lot of concerns about the safety of children in residential care. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to ensure that children are safe uh, wherever they are, whether they're in the home or if they're in out-of-home care, mm -hmm. whether it's residential care or foster care or other types of alternative care arrangements. Um, so uh, so we've, got to, we've got to look at why very young children are being placed in residential care. Mm -hmm. uh, the government's come out with a plan that I don't think uh, stacks up. Most people say to me it doesn't stack up. They're trying to reduce uh, residential care beds at the time where demand's actually going up. The Auditor General has said there's going to be a 30% increase in demand. Um, and, and so if they're not going into residential care, where are they going to go? Um, but uh, where they are going into residential care, we've actually got children um, as young as seven being placed in residential care. Now, I don't think that's appropriate. Uh, we should try and, and provide a family-like environment for children as much as possible. So that's going to be kinship care, that's going to be foster care. Um, and, and in relation to those, um, we are seeing more foster carers leaving the system than are entering the system. Uh, that's of concern to me. Uh, so we need to strengthen our foster care, mm -hmm. we need to strengthen our kinship care. Uh, they should be the, uh, the, the first port of call and residential care should be the last resort. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask a question, so just in terms of if there's anything that you'd like to further elaborate on in terms of, I guess, number of foster carers, an increase in the need for foster carers uh, and a reduction in the number of foster carers is, is the picture that we're facing. How would you look to address so what, would, what specific issues might you put in place? <coughs> uh, well, you know, we've still got a few more days to go and we'll be having Certainly. more to say around the detail of that. Um, but, uh, you know, if, I just, if we just look at the fact that the government, um, one of its first things that it did in relation to foster care is it got rid of the centralised recruitment strategy that, the, that we as the previous mm -hmm. government had put in place. Um, so what's happening now is you've got every foster care agency around the state running its own ad hoc recruitment strategies. Uh, I think those issues have got to be looked at. It's got to be a more coordinated approach to how we recruit and retain foster carers. We've got um, a, a situation where, depending on which regional office of the Department of Foster Care uh, approaches for reimbursement of out-of-pocket expenses, mm -hmm. they get different responses. Uh, depending on which time of the financial year, if money's run out, they get a different response as to whether they can claim things. Uh, you know, that's just an unacceptable situation. Mm -hmm. Foster carers need to understand what the rules are, mm -hmm. uh, what they're entitled to uh, get reimbursed for, and, uh, and to have a clear policy setting that makes it fair for foster carers and doesn't actively discourage them um, from participating uh, as foster carers. You know, we absolutely value the important role that foster carers play. Uh, they are selfless people. I know they don't do it for the money. They are incredibly generous in terms of supporting the most vulnerable uh, children in, in our society. Uh, and we need to support foster care is better. We look forward to seeing more over the next few days from the sound of it as well, Jenny. Mm. Uh, in terms of uh, family violence, which we've touched on in a number of different portfolios today as well, uh, we've been there's been significant issue on a significant uh, focus, I guess, in terms of looking at family violence over this election, which has been a really positive thing to see. So unfortunately, while the numbers are increasing significantly, we have seen each party really, I think, step up and look at. Um, a suite of initiatives around mm. family violence. One of the questions I think for our members is looking at within that context, what support would a Labor government provide to specialist family violence agencies who really work at the front line to enable them to continue to do the work uh, that they do and in response to what's one of the biggest issues in our society? Well, well, the starting point, of course, is that we've announced, and I'm very proud of this, uh, mm. the first ever Royal Commission into Family mm. Violence. They'll be the first in the country. Uh, and that's going to be the driver behind how we approach this issue in the future and that's going to obviously flow on to um, the, uh, the impact in my area and in child protection and how we provide better support in, mm. in the early intervention space and, and try and 
uh, keep fam at risk families uh, from actually entering the child mm -hmm. protection system, as I alluded to earlier. Um, but uh, there, there are a range of um, announcements that mm -hmm. we've already made uh, support to um, uh, to better strengthen the existing services that are there in relation to family violence. Um, and you know that's a, that's a range of a range of initiatives, but. Um, the, the key focus has actually got to be on um, trying to tackle, you know, the, the causes behind family violence, changing the the, the culture, um, and it's a white ribbon day today, and uh, you know, just about reinforcing the message that uh, it's a crime, it's not acceptable, and that's got to be from us as politicians providing that leadership role, the chief commission of police, and others um, constantly reinforcing exactly. that it, that it's got to be tackled in a more a systemic way than we have been doing in the past. And so in terms of the specialist family violence services yep. though, is there, in terms of um, perhaps within your package, any initiatives that you've got that really look at supporting those specialist family violence agencies that work at the front line? Absolutely. And we've got, um, we've got a range of, this is just the first stage of this. And mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a fantastic commitment. Let me run through mm -hmm. a few of them. Right. So um, 1.4 million for Domestic Violence Victoria. I mean, fantastic. Uh, to employ additional staff. As you know, they have a very, very small staff who do a sensational job. Uh, 12 million to expand uh, the Family Violence Court Division in the Magistrates Court. Really, really crucial thing. Something, Five, something that we started, we yes. initiated as the previous government yep. and had those dedicated Family Violence Courts exactly. and Magistrates Courts. One to 1.2 million uh, Family Violence Lawyers at Community Legal Centres. I mean, this is at the heart of the front line. So DV Vic, uh, family violence courts, uh, support to the, to the legal services, uh, 2.5 million for children's counsellors and other specialist care for young people who witness violence in the home. I mean, these are really crucial first stage, uh, Emma, to uh, the first down payment, frankly, by a, a, Labor, a, a, a Labor government to this most fundamental scourge in our society. And, as Jenny said, and James, we were at the uh, at our at our state conference when Daniel, uh, I think, made an extraordinary speech, an electric speech at our conference, which, um, you know, grown men at the back of the room were crying at his speech, uh, and it, it spoke to who he is. It spoke to how deeply committed. Not only we are, but our leader is to addressing this question of domestic violence, this terrible scourge, which is so much a part of our community. And for the potential future premier of this state to say this is his, this is one of his first priorities, speaks to his commitment and our commitment to it. Um, and he has indicated uh, in, in that speech and subsequently, we will support in full all of the recommendations of that Royal Commission. And, that, and that's really an, an important point. You know, this is a two-step process. Yep. There are immediate, this is a down things, payment. immediate things we can do to support frontline mm. services, as you say, but the real transformative change will take place through the Royal Commission. You know, the highest level of inquiry, yep. nothing is off limits, mm -hmm. and, and as Richard said, we will implement them, them in full, and, and we know that's a big call. Yep. Yes. Um, so, yeah. you know... Two I, up. You've got to do both. You've got to do both. And, and to, um, if you just do the first, you know, it, it increase resources, that's good, mm. but it's not going to have the transformative change um, to really tackle family violence. Mm. And when you've got the Chief Commissioner of Police, I mean, yes. what a partnership when you've got the Chief Commissioner of Police uh, and, the high, and the highest political office in the state together saying, we are going to make this a priority. You're going, to, you're going to get change. That's great. Thank you for a very comprehensive mm. answer. Uh, in terms of looking at recommissioning, I know yes. this is discussions we've had with each of you, so I'll leave it open to, for all of you to have this discussion. We've seen um, the community sector, as you know, has been deeply concerned about the recommissioning process that's taken place in uh, mental health yes. and in the drug and alcohol space mm. as well. Uh, and we've, we've talked about those issues at length and our members are, are very aware of uh, yes. what the consequences of that may be. Can you confirm that if Labor wins the election, that you won't re-tender whole funding programs using competitive tendering? Uh, well, we're going to completely review it. I mean, we made that clear in our mental uh, in our mental health um, uh, statement that we put out, uh, I think, last week. 
there is a very clear articulation of that. Uh, because this speaks to the crucial role, and this is an important message that we want to send to, the, to your sector. We value small organisations. We absolutely value them. And uh, as, again, an initial uh, down payment on that, we announced that we would uh, refund immediately three of those organisations, St Mary's House of Welcome, Jesuit Social Services and Paran Mission. Uh, with their mental health funding because, let me just talk about the one in my world that I know so well, uh, St Mary's House of Welcome. Beautiful people, beautiful people who are working with the most vulnerable homeless people with any range of, uh, of problems uh, that you can possibly think of. They provide the most, and you know this, they provide the most basic services from showers to food to clothing and to have four and a half staff taken away from this small organisation is, 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 is frankly inexcusable, completely inexcusable uh, and we wanted to demonstrate our commitment not just to St Mary's House of Welcome but to send a message to the sector that these small organisations, we value them and we think that the supports that they provide are absolutely crucial because it is the nature of the relationship that you have, which is often built up over years uh, with these with homeless people who, who really often live on the margins of our community, to suggest to, to these people, well, access your mental health services somewhere else is a nonsense. And, and frankly, Mary Wardrews just doesn't get it. I mean, this notion of service efficiency. So to say to a homeless person in my part of the world who's living, potentially living on the street or living in uh, a vulnerable, um, uh, in vulnerable accommodation, go and access your mental health services from Fitzroy in, in Hawthorne, mm. someone who they don't know, someone who they have no relationship with, you might as well say, well, fly to the moon. I mean, it, it's not going to happen. So just to clarify, um, in terms of looking at the ALP's commitment uh, to the community sector yeah. and in terms of relations with the community sector, can you confirm that if Labor wins the election that you will not re-tender um, whole funding programs using a competitive tendering approach? Yeah, we, we have made it very clear in our mental health uh, statement that we put out uh, in the last few days. We have a specific uh, section in that statement which goes to the question of the tendering out of the uh, mental health uh, services, which we think has been a complete disaster. We value small organisations, and if there's one message that comes out of today, we want the sector to understand that uh, small organisations are absolutely crucial, uh, and we value them. So we, uh, as a first stage in that, uh, have obviously uh, ensured that small organisations like uh, St Mary's House of Welcome in my own area, Paran Mission uh, and the Jesuits to name three in the first instance uh, we have indicated that we will refund their services. Mm -hmm. uh, St Mary's for instance lost four and a half staff mm -hmm. and to suggest to homeless people who may have had a relationship with St Mary's House of Welcome for years and years and years that they would access their mental health services somewhere else uh, you might as well say fly to the moon. I mean, it's not going to happen and people are falling through the cracks. So the message that we send to the community sector more generally is mm -hmm. that we will not be undertaking that form of uh, service delivery in the future and we will be looking at it in a much more systemic way mm -hmm. to ensure that uh, the services are so crucial to the lives of the most vulnerable in our community actually fit in the community sector mm -hmm. and in community organisations where they have done magnificent work across the board. Thank you. And so that, so in that context, so what I'm hearing from you, so, you, mm -hmm. so does that, uh, just to clarify, mm -hmm. so you won't engage in a competitive tendering process of the type that we've seen in the mental Correct. health space? Correct. Correct.
Uh, in terms of looking at the broader engagement with the community sector overall as well, one of the things that uh, we've seen established over the last uh, period of government has been the Community Sector Reform Council, which has enabled some high-level discussions with the community sector, departmental secretaries and deputy secretaries in a way that we've not, we've not seen before. Uh, does the ALP have a view about setting up a, a process that would be, be similar to that or you know, a structure a structure of some sort that will enable a community sector to be able to engage and, and have, a, I guess, a permissible form of discussions with departmental secretaries and deputy secretaries on, on that type of scale? Well, um, we're going to engage with the sector, make that absolutely mm. clear. What I've heard in, in my portfolio areas is, is a sense of frustration from the sector that they don't feel that they have been engaged on a number of issues. Some people have been around the table, but a lot of people have felt you know, that they haven't been able to engage. So uh, we will look at the structure that we think is, uh, is the most appropriate vehicle, but there clearly will be a strong dialogue. There will be a partnership approach in terms of um, uh, feeding through ideas for policy development and uh, reform. And uh, we, will, um, we will certainly be um, in close dialogue with, with the sector on a role, whole range of issues. Mm -hmm. And in terms of looking at the relationships with departmental secretaries, sorry, Richard, no, just no. jumped in first. Um, the relationship with the departmental secretaries, which I think is something that's been a really positive thing in that, um, you know, while governments might change, the departmental secretaries, you know, fundamentally tend to remain around the table. Uh, is that something that you've thought about in terms of future structure, or is that something you, you look at once? Well, well, we've done that ourselves in government. Um, you know, I, mm -hmm. I and Richard uh, mm -hmm. in government chaired the, the Aboriginal Justice Forum. Mm -hmm. We had departmental secretaries, we had the Chief Commissioner yep. of Police come to those forums and engage directly with uh, community representatives. Mm -hmm. So it's not a new thing, um, it's something that we've done in government mm -hmm. and uh, we want to ensure that people feel that they are able to access us as elected representatives but also senior bureaucrats as well. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I think Jenny's right. I mean, if, if there's one thing you can say about um, Labor governments, we're accessible. Uh, and uh, I don't think, uh, you know, I mean, and there has been criticism of, uh, of this government from the sector. I mean, you know that, uh, that um, ministers have not been as accessible as what you would hope for. Um, you know, Sometimes you're on the cup of tea list and sometimes you're not on the cup of tea list. I mean, you know, it's ridiculous. Uh, I mean, the community sector is a uh, strong and, and vibrant uh, area and there are a range of voices. Uh, and we want to make sure that all of those voices have the opportunity to be heard and not just a few. Obviously, peak bodies like your own are, are crucial to that. Uh, but we really uh, have always wanted to uh, and how our whole approach has always been to work uh, collaboratively across the community sector and not you know, be picking and choosing you know, what voices we, we might like to hear. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying. Mm. Uh, in terms of NDIS, so I think NDIS has been an incredibly welcome initiative. Yes. When the NDIS is fully rolled out, it will only pick up about 2% of the Victorian population. So yes. given that we've got about 20% of the Victorian population uh, with disabilities, how will a future Labor government address that gap between NDIS and, and really caring for those in our community who've got disabilities and who've got mental health issues yeah. as well? Yeah. Well, NDIS is a groundbreaking reform, and I'm mm. proud that it's a groundbreaking mm. Labor reform. Mm. Uh, and it, so it's always had strong support from Victorian Labor. And you know, we look forward to the rollout beginning in 2016 mm. to the full implementation uh, in 2019. And so we have to work through a whole range of issues um, in terms of how we ensure that uh, those people who are in tier two and you know uh, continue to receive ongoing mm. support from government. Yep. The, the spirit, the intention behind NDIS is to ensure that people receive services, uh, receive a, a better uh, access to services uh, and uh, we can address the, the, the waiting lists that have blown mm. out every single year during the term of uh, this government, mm. um, every single year that waiting lists has grown on the Disability Support Register, how people can get access to services. So we're going to have to look at mm -hmm. how we can continue to provide support for um, for those people um, going forward um, and work with the NDIA agency as well mm -hmm. as the federal government to ensure that the NDIA actually meets the, um, the spirit and the intention that was behind it originally. Thank you. And, and if I can add Emma, yeah. just in terms of uh, education, 
One is uh, pursuing the Gonski funding, yep. and one of the key components of that yes. was an additional loading for students yes. with disabilities. So pursuing that funding mm. and then delivering it to uh, Victorian yep. families. Then the second issue is around um, a, a really innovative package of support for uh, students with additional needs. Mm. So under a Labor government, uh, you, can, you will not be able to be registered as a teacher if the tertiary institution has not provided compulsory special needs training. Mm -hmm. So in every classroom, uh, there'll be one, three, five, seven kids um, on the spectrum or dyslexia mm -hmm. or dyspraxia, um, kids with additional needs, yet the, the, our training in this area is woeful. So we'll make that compulsory. Mm -hmm. uh, we've announced a, a capital fund for schools um, to provide additional sports for students with additional with uh, special needs, whether it's a sensory garden or whether it's a, a permanent space uh, for for the students and for the teacher aides. Um, so we we've made a whole raft of announcements in terms of uh, mm -hmm. special needs education. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying that. Uh, moving on to the powers of the Auditor General, and people are often are a bit surprised when we talk about this as VCOS, but VCOS is particularly concerned, I guess, a that all public money is, is spent to genuine public good and also I guess at the end of the day when we look at uh, genuine scrutiny of projects we want to know that money is spent well and fundamentally looking at anything that's left we want to see a significant investment in our community sector. Sure. There's been a lot of commentary lately around the powers of the Auditor General and the current lack of powers to follow the dollar in public private partnerships. Mm. We've seen an increase in number of public private partnerships over time. Does the ALP commit to increasing the powers of the Auditor General to follow the dollar should you win power? Uh, the short answer is, is yes, and we'll be working with the Auditor General to provide him uh, with the ability to uh, allow the system to be more transparent and more accountable. So it's, it's in relation to follow the dollar with triple P's. Not to say triple P's aren't a bad thing. You know, we, we had a, a package of schools delivered under the triple P program, and I think that's been a success. Um, and we may well do that yeah. again if, if we're in government. Um, but uh, you know we've made a, a raft of uh, commitments around increasing transparency and accountability, whether that's through FOI, uh, whether it's through um, working with the Auditor General so he can do uh, his mm. job better, mm. whether that's following the dollar, um, or whether that is in relation to how the uh, Education Department has treated their own um, stock and writing it mm. down, you know, it's mm. extraordinary, extraordinary that the Auditor General <coughs> has given a uh, qualified. qualified, qualified report um, to to Victoria's books. Mm. You know, that is a complete slap in the face to um, Treasurer Michael O'Brien. Mm. Um, so we'll, we, we will be working with the Auditor General to um, provide him with those additional powers. Fantastic, thank you. And finally, in terms of, um, you were kind enough to speak at our AGM, James, and one of the questions we asked you there was around the equal remuneration order for the community sector. Just to clarify, so there's a commitment from the ALP that, that uh, should you be uh, in power as of uh, Saturday, uh, that you commit to fully funding the community sector for the equal remuneration order. Yeah, it's, uh, as I said at the, uh, at the forum, that that will be a responsibility for an incoming government. Thank you. And in terms, in addition to that, looking at the indexation for the community sector, which is, is a significant thing in terms of meeting the genuine costs of running businesses and meeting the needs of the community sector, uh, do you commit to providing a level of indexation that will meet those genuine needs of running and community sector organisations? Yeah, look, and I think in answering these questions, it's, um, it's difficult to give you an exact figure or an exact percentage of, of what we'll do, but we've got a track record of um, providing that indexation support um, and you know I don't know Jenny and Richard might want to add to my comments but um, again that would be our responsibility. Mm. Thank you. Yep. Well it's we value the community sector mm. you know we want to achieve fair and reasonable outcomes for the community sector to enable them to keep doing the work that they the important work that they do to support um, so many vulnerable people in the community so of course it'll be a, a, a a question of working through what's possible, but having dialogue and genuine dialogue with the community sector around these issues. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank you enormously for making the time to come in today. I think it's been fantastic to explore a really wide variety of issues that really matter to the Victorian community. It's very generous of you all to give your time, and uh, thank you very much for being here today. Thanks.